Okay, hi. Um, we are, our project is focused on looking at a, mem a memorial exemplarity, and primarily we're going to be looking at um, different Holocaust rescuers and looking at the way in which, although they did very um, courageous things, they saved Jews, uh, they saved Jews um, during World War II, they were very humble it's about these um, types of actions. And it's pretty amazing, really, how for all the risks that they took, they, they, kind of, they couldn't have seen themselves doing anything but actually helping these people out. So we're going to look at and kind of explore some narrative interviews of these people as a way to think about what kind of components of, 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 of um, being humble might be a part of their lives. So when you look at, um, so we're going to be looking at these, uh, these um, particular rescuers um, uh, uh, from the Holocaust. And uh, in looking at uh, current psychological definitions of being humble, um, I see there was a few that kind of stood out to us. One was that they're often focused on others, and they're also very open to others. And in looking at these narratives, we also, let's see, we found that um, oftentimes the uh, suffering of another uh, creates, uh, creates a sense of moral salience that kind of compels them to want to help and to want to act for these kinds of people. They also see themselves as part of a common, uh, see, as part of a common, um, a universal humanity. Uh, see, the other thing uh, that they, uh, see these, uh, sorry, the other thing that these people uh, see actually demonstrate is they have an accurate assessment of themselves. There was no kind of elevated sense of uh, moral superiority. They saw their, see, they saw the types of actions that they did as kind of normal, meaning that they couldn't have seen the world or seen uh, them doing anything else but actually helping these a particular pe these a particular persons out. Um, so the moral exemplars don't see themselves as doing anything that, 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 uh, doing anything that extraordinary. Now, um, our ideas of kind of where this type of exemplarity actually come from actually start from, uh, from, from um, looking at habits and believing that these habits begin to form different types of schemas and that these moral schemas constrain the ways in which these people to actually see themselves and see themselves in the world in terms of the moral actions that they are a part of. And um, there's some other um, psychological research that also shows that there can be, uh, see, there can be differences in terms of the, the uh, schemas of, 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 of um, either experts or, or, or um, novices. And this is in a, a, a two different researches. And so for, for, for uh, from, from, um, from, um, from Monroe's research, she identified moral identity as being the, the, the primary thing that led to these people doing the things that they did um, dur um, uh, during the war. Now, um, there's, another, there's another set of, uh, of um, a different research that actually shows that the, the more the self views moral identity as a part of the self and very important to actually who they are and how they see themselves, it actually increases the amount of moral behaviors that they actually, that they actually um, are a part of. And so, um, and this is, it's, see this is actually, this is actually um, several different studies that actually did this. Um, students actually donated more food and actually volunteered more. Uh, there was an associations with uh, with their own with their own uh, with their own um, uh, um, um, religiosity, and it actually increased their their own their own their own their own um, empathy, and actually decreased the, uh, um, their 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 aggression. Um, and then stronger uh, stronger associations with the moral identity also decreased uh, the uh, negative perceptions of 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 um, a different outgroups as well. Let's see, so. Now, one of the problems that we identified in trying to actually measure this particular virtue is that it's very hard to actually measure it from a self-report stance because people who are very humble will never say that they're very humble, but people who aren't very humble will, of course, say that they're very humble. And so it creates this problem of how do you go about analyzing or trying to find this within the data. So what we want to do is by looking at these different narratives, well, I should say one more thing, um, and this is actually a problem for a lot of different aspects of, of, uh, of both virtue and, and morally exemplary 
behavior. It's that most people will underport if they really are courageous or they're compassionate or they're loving, they're not going to be as forthcoming in terms of actually showing that off. And so it creates, it, it means we have to find other ways to actually investigate these, these, these um, types of virtues. And, and we think one of the ways to do that is to do more of a, of a, a computational analysis using different types of of um, a text like the narrative interviews that we're going to be working with. I've got one more. Oh, one more. Oh, that's right. So, um, as far as the types of integration that we're doing at the psychological level, we're starting at the level of of more implicit cognitive mechanisms that we believe um, play a role in the formation of different schemas, and these schemas. Um, are the main contributors to the formation of moral identity and then ultimately towards moral action. At the philosophical level, we believe that looking at moral exemplarity is a great kind of foundation to really understanding and doing different types of, 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 um, of virtue theories. We need to start, or um, as, 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 Melinda, as Linda Zagzebski would say, we need to start with moral exemplarities as a starting point for actually doing this type of of virtue theorizing. Okay, thanks James. Um, <clears throat> so out of our study of the literature, then we formed some hypotheses that humility is a virtue that affects moral action and self-identity, and that humans have a prototype, a prototype concept of humility. And then, but there's also humility which is implicitly embedded within the self-narratives, but is not explicitly stated necessarily by those self-narratives, especially for the Holocaust rescuers. So we're gonna use, so we believe we can use semantic analysis to find markers of implicit humility within those self-narratives. And then these implicit markers of humility can relate to the explicit concept of humility created by the prototype, but it's not identical with it. So we need the explicit understanding of humility in order to make sure that the implicit measures that we're creating are actually of humility and not something that's related. So roughly our research plan is that we're gonna develop the explicit prototypes of humility by creating term descriptors and then use semantic analysis of the, narr of the narratives in order to develop the implicit uh, measures of humility. And then we'll compare the implicit and explicit characterizations using empirical, philosophical, and computational methods. And then one of the key outcomes of this uh, project will be we can distribute the exemplar narratives of the Holocaust rescuers that are not, some of which are not available to researchers now. And we'll annotate or code those with the humility measures that we developed, as well as make this kind of more computational method more accessible um, with, uh, to other researchers. So to kind of pick a, kind of a baseline linear uh, um, organization of our research method. So first thing we do is we develop these descriptors of humility. So one way of doing that that's been done within moral psychology is to come up with a prototype uh, list of descriptors. But we wanna also, in addition to that, we'll use that as kind of seeds to do data mining of some big data resources. So we can find out what else is out there in text in general. Um, and then also using you know, kind of more standard moral psychology uh, approach or cognitive psychology, um, we'll generate, have uh, individuals generate prototypicality ratings. So they'll take the terms that'll include both the terms that came from the uh, human coming up with descriptors as well as those that came up that we generated computationally and have individuals uh, rate those on a Likert scale of how central those descriptors are to their understanding of humility. As a parallel method, we'll use uh, computational methods, uh, similarities, uh, scores, in order to find relationships between those descriptors. So at this point, we'll actually, in a sense, have a four by four result. We'll have the source being either human or computation, and then we'll have scores being both human and computation. So that will give us a explicit understanding of humility. And we'll use that as probes in semantic analysis against the exemplar narratives in order to pull out passages and other aspects that are associated with humility, but aren't necessarily explicit. One of the things with semantic analysis is 
that it, because it translates using co-occurrence some of the words that are associated with humility, um, it can actually pull out passages that don't necessarily mention the terms that are fed in as a probe. <clears throat> in addition to that, we're also going to look at the moral psychology literature, uh, moral philosophical literature, and the moral psychology instruments. So instruments for humility. We can take these instruments and then use the, the, the terms within those as an additional type of probe. So because the Holocaust rescuers generally are no longer living, there's no way to ask them to take a self-report measure. But we can look at an autobiographical uh, narrative and then take the instrument uh, stems, the questions that would be on an instrument, and then use those as a probe against semantic, against the uh, narratives. And we should get a similarity score that is correlated with uh, what would happen if someone, if they were to take that self-report. And so that's been done also within the, the moral psychology literature. So we'll have these three different probes from the survey instruments, from the folk prototypes, and then the data mining um, in order to compare against the exemplar narratives. And so then we'll generate a conceptual model of this implicit humility out of those different measures, and then we'll use that conceptual model to then you know, go back into the philosophical literature to create what we, our understanding of implicit humility. So deep integration, just very briefly. So in the methodology, uh, both in the data sources and the analysis, we're using kind of psychological, computational, and philosophical methods. You know, our team, both we've worked within both science and humanities. Also some uh, depth within, for example, Kristen Monroe, who's done the uh, Holocaust rescuers within psychology also within philosophy, and then we've been developing some integrative bridge models that help us situate our research you know, with more of a, within a theological anthropology and a deeper understanding of not just the present study, but then how we can interact. So some of the challenges and um, ways that we'll respond. So as we're collecting these, uh, generating the term descriptors, then it could be that using the uh, computational, the psychological, and the philosophical uh, sources, we, it may turn out that there's not really much difference between them. One sense that'll be great. We'll kind of confirm what we're doing. They could be too far apart, uh, in which case we'll actually need to generate more descriptors and do some type of, of substructure analysis to find out uh, where some of the complexity was coming from, where there are multiple aspects of humility. Uh, it's possible semantic analysis uh, is lacking in explanatory power, so there are other methods that we may use. Within this multidisciplinary approach, we don't necessarily want to use the most cutting edge with te uh, technology within computer science or within moral psychology. We want to actually use something that's a little bit more tried and true in order to do the relationship. That way, when we run into issues, we can then go to the literature and to other, other sources to actually um, adapt our process. Whereas if we're always using cutting edge and something doesn't work, then we won't know, in a sense, which discipline we need to, to draw upon. It's possible that some multiple methods may not work, uh, in which case there are uh, other techniques that we can uh, draw upon, including some type of cluster analysis. So it's also possible that the uh, exemplar narratives won't uh, give us enough information given the techniques that we're doing. Then we'll go and we'll gather other, other narratives from other sources. And then, in, of course, in terms of time limitations, such as I'm running into now, um, because the research steps include these incremental evaluations, at any stage, we can kind of focus on what we our best results so far and pursue those, even if it leads to something that's not comparative. So in summary, what we plan to do is investigate the implicit and the explicit aspects of moral and self schemas using computational analysis, along with these other approaches. Understand the implicit values of humility that initiated these or extraordinary moral actions. So what motivated them, we're saying is part of their humble stance and then investigate the role of schemas in forming the moral self and its relationship to virtue. And then again, you know, we want to make sure that we get these rescuer transcripts out to a wider audience.
So thank you. So <clears throat> latent semantic analysis, as you know, just looks at surface associations among words. And as you sort of implied with respect to the folk prototypes, those narratives are going to be shaped by the cultural expectations and norms of society. So I'm kind of curious how you think this approach can go beyond simply sort of the way culture has shaped our way to talk about our, our expressions of humility. The analyses, I think, are going to be highly loaded by those cultural expressions, and those expressions themselves may not specifically have underlying psychological correspondence. So how do you assess that? Um, so, so one way is by using the variety of instruments that we're probing against the semantic analysis space. Ideally, um, the semantic analysis space should be somewhat neutral, um, uh, certainly less biased than just using a, a uh, kind of, if we were driving the analysis ourselves. Um, I think you're, you're, uh, you're correct in that uh, there's still an aspect of a cultural bias that's going to come in there. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's certainly going to be tough to avoid. One of the ways to do that would be through other, through philosophical instruments that have tried to avoid some of that cultural bias. Um, one of the advantages is that, for example, we go through all these collections collect all these term descriptors, and there is something else that is not um, associated, uh, that is associated with humility, but it's not something that's explicit within our culture's prototype, then it's possible as long as there's descriptions of that within the sem uh, semantic space, that we would still pull that out as an implicit uh, understanding. Uh, and if we simply just can't get away from it, then some of the other techniques uh, the semantic analysis generally, though it doesn't have to, does primarily use um, kind of more, you know, Western sources. But some of the other techniques, like some of the Google techniques, I mean, there is a worldwide uh, search of a variety of different texts that may be able to bring about, pull out something that is more cross-cultural. I, I, I didn't want to focus just on the semantic analysis per se. But if you're taking personal narratives and you're taking textual sources and subjective reports or self-reports, they're all framed through a linguistic lens. Mm -hmm. So regardless of which analytic technique you use, as long as you're using something that's a kind of narrative expressive form across different modalities, they'll be shaped by this kind of cultural lens, which I'm not going to call a bias necessarily. Right. but it will be an overlay that organizes those responses. Yeah, I mean, I think the under, uh, coming, drawing primarily among the Holocaust rescuers, I mean, we're going to get the understanding of humility that, you know, is there within that, and we think that's valuable. Um, I mean, a couple of things that will may clarify that is, you know, uh, we've got kind of on the back of this, uh, some narratives from hospice workers, it's cross-cultural, and then actually with the term descriptors, uh, some of those will be generated just by undergraduate students because Walker found that that you know, seemed to be adequate. We may go to Mechanical Turk if needed, but the undergraduate populations we have in Southern California are actually fairly diverse. So I, I got a sense that, the, like for example, the large caregivers who also might express humility seem very different as a group from Holocaust uh, survivors. In, in talking to Kristen about the Holocaust survivors, for example. Right, and so in a sense, one of the reasons to do the prototype uh, descriptors like we're doing rather than just you know, from the literature is so that uh, when we do the, the rating, we can actually kind of compare um, some of those methods. Um, so uh, we're anticipating that it may be specific to the Holocaust rescuers, this understanding of humility that we get out. Will, and then Doug. Ask to speak directly into the mic. So, uh, yeah, very interesting, uh, creative way of getting at humility. I'm wondering if, to help understand it a little better, if you could just give some examples of the kinds of things you expect to find from the linguistic analysis of the texts. So wh what might you find that would show right. humility? Uh, so one of the things, so 
one of the out things that may come out of looking at the narratives, uh, you know, this kind of you know attitude of virtue that may include aspects of courage, you know, justice, righteousness. Uh, but around humility, as it's used in the literature, what we're hoping to find is is a shift, you know, within the semantic space. So perhaps they t they are using uh, uh, they're talking about themselves less than is normally associated with the um, um, kind of the, the concepts and topics that are around you know, the humility. Uh, and so in that case, what we'll notice is a shift kind of in the vector space in a way that's away from descriptors of the self. The, maybe to be more clear is instead of using kind of a vector representation, if we were using something that was more about explicit use of language, like a linguistic inquiry word count, which maps different, uh, uh, looks at like, for example, pronoun use. We might find, if we were to, in that kind of technique, that um, when the exemplars are using you know, humility, that they're using more kind of you know, us, we, you know, as opposed to I or they, you know, that distinguish more of kind of a, a me versus an out group, but that the language itself is more integrative. And so with the semantic analysis, we may find some direction that kind of re is a representation of that that's not limited to pronoun use. Doug, then Owen. Yes, I'm going to go off in a, a slightly different direction, and this is really more of a curiosity question. I mean, I'm just intrigued by this idea that um, people risk their lives and then consider themselves to be ordinary. And I, I wonder your thoughts about this. I mean, could it be that they really are pretty ordinary in the sense that we do have a universal tendency to help those in need? I was just talking to um, a Polish man who was three years old during the Holocaust, and he remarked that it took 47 Polish families to save one family of Poles, and it was his family he was saved. Um, of course, similar things happened in Denmark in terms of protecting the Jews, and you're documenting Germany. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about maybe looking at this through a different lens, that maybe this is more normal than we think. Um, I, I can respond if you want to. Well, well I, th I mean, they are ordinary in that they're drawing from the same kind of common, common types of human nature that could be, they could be any of us, I think, to a certain extent. Um, whether or not it's, it's kind of universally possible that we kind of tend towards that, it's hard to say, I don't know. I mean, because one, one context, you see how much violence can actually erupt without a whole lot of work. And, another, let's see, and then in a different context, you see how, how people really can care for one another. So I, it is universal in that it's probably universally possible. I don't know if we tend that way or this way. I don't know if you could say that or not. Owen? Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's good. I'm a little worried about the um, connection between three aspects of the project. Um, so I really get the humility. I mean, I get the, the research on humility and how that's going to work. But I, wor I worry about the link with the um, uh, Holocaust, uh, you, you, you mentioned Monroe's book. Now, that's an interview with five um, rescuers. Right. Right. There's a huge amount of other literature which um, cites uh, features of Holocaust rescuers. For example, uh, if, you have a, if you were a juvenile delinquent when you were younger, high probability, risk-taking. Uh, we talked about that earlier. Um, being a member of a socially marginalized group, these are all like high predictors. So one can see, but what you're right about is almost all the literature um, has people say things like, well, I had to do that. Mm -hmm. But Oscar Schindler, who was no humble guy, has said he had to do that. Right. Um, right. So um, the phenomenology of no, I, couldn't do, I couldn't but do that is familiar. Humility, I don't see the connection. I mean, I think you'd have to worry about sampling. I, I, I don't know quite how you would start without really doing great sampling of Holocaust rescuers and then see what turns up. The fact that when someone looks at this group or that group, um, they find, um, as Monroe did in her book, it's a fairly controversial take, as I understand it. So it seemed to me that you were required yourself to buy into her view that almost all Holocaust survivors were courageous, humble, uh, they could not have done otherwise, and then you were going to track 
the humility part, and I just uh, think you have to buy into too much. I'm worried about that. Well, I think it may be the case not, that not, not all of the rescuers, not all of them might be humble, but I think from her sample, I think you can say that. Five. Well, there's a few we do more have than five. More. I mean, there's that's part of this project will be to actually, there are more interviews that she did that right. didn't make it into the book. So we will have more than five. Yeah. Our time is up. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.